Welcome everybody. My name is Joe Mull. I'm so excited that you're joining us for our webcast on staying mentally fit in uncertain times. Today is about some self-care. It's about recharging. It's about also equipping you with some, some strategies and some self-talk and some tactics to navigate the weeks ahead. Uh, these are obviously unique and challenging times affecting all of us. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that right now everyone's circumstances are similar and different. You know, we are all of us here in the U.S. Uh, enduring this crisis together. Um, but the ways in which it's impacting us and the ways in which we are personally responding to it and the ways in which the people around us are responding to it are all very different. And we're going to share with you in a few minutes what, what some of those differences are. But I think it's important to acknowledge that different people are in different places and struggling with different things right now. Uh, what we want to do today is provide a, a vehicle for you to get some help, maybe in some of the areas where uh, you are struggling a little bit. We care very much about you. We're here to support you however we can. Uh, I know that in the, the preparatory conversations that my fellow panelists and I had for today, one of the things that we felt was really important to communicate with you right out of the gate uh, is that we don't claim to have all the answers. Um, in fact, some of the things that we're all struggling with right now aren't necessarily things to be fixed. Sometimes there are things that we just have to endure, that we have to overcome, uh, and things that we have to survive. And so hopefully today we can share with you some best practices to help you survive the various challenges you are facing. So our ask is pretty simple. Take from this what you can. Um, also know that even though we are all facing some very serious and intense and sometimes life and death challenges, um, we do want to have a little bit of fun today. And know that when we're having a little bit of fun today, um, it is not because we aren't taking seriously the struggles that everyone is dealing with right now. Uh, we just want this little bit of time, this pause, uh, to, to have some levity and to bring some energy to it. So um, with that, logistically, please know that we will be ending about 1245. Uh, if you need a restroom at any time, you can find them wherever you are. Uh, and if you would disable your phones right now so as not to disturb the neighbors around you who probably shouldn't be there. If there are neighbors around you, you should, you should social distance and spread out. And so with that, I'm super excited to introduce our panelists today. Um, I enjoy surrounding myself with people who are much smarter than I am because it makes me look smart. And so uh, I'm first excited to introduce you to Dr. Renee Thompson. She's the one waving. Hi. Renee has spent more than 27 years as a clinical nurse, nurse educator, a quality manager, and a nurse executive. She is the founder and CEO of the Healthy Workforce Institute, which is the only organization in the world solely dedicated to eliminating bullying and incivility in healthcare. Mm -hmm. And Renee has been repeatedly published, interviewed, and awarded for her work to educate, connect, and inspire current and future nurses. That's and great. Renee is also a mother, a, a new, newish grandmother. Love my grandbaby, yes. A, a wife, an author, and Renee considers good wine essential to any quarantine stockpile. I should have had my <laughs> bottle as a prop. It's right there. I'm looking at it, okay? <laughs> nice. Also with us today, uh, I'm super excited to introduce you to Steve Wise. Steve is waving. Hey, guys. Steve is a licensed clinical social worker who has been working with clients in private practice for more than five years. He is the founder and owner of Mental Fitness, LLC. Steve and his team of counselors and coaches provide programs and services to help their clients master their thinking in order to master their lives. And as a speaker and author, Steve has developed a mental fitness curriculum, which is going to be featured in his upcoming book. That Steve is, is also a father and I a am. husband. Uh, and you know immediately that he's an exceptional human being when you find out that he is the owner of five rescue dogs. Uh, yes. It is, is very hard to wear black for professional presentations. I'm always <laughs> covered in fur. Fantastic. Uh, and as for me, um, I'm a Pisces who loves musical theater and Disney movies. That, those are my only qualifications for being here today. Uh, I'm just kidding. I uh, speak and write about commitment in the workplace and was previously the head of learning and development for one of the largest position groups here uh, in the U.S., and for the last seven years, I've worked with organizations across the country teaching leaders how to be better bosses uh, and build stronger teams. Uh, Renee, what were you supposed to be doing this week? And what are you finding yourself doing that you didn't expect? 
Oh gosh. So I was supposed to be traveling um, to New York City this week okay. to work with one of my consulting clients. And then my two besties who I've known since almost birth, uh, I was um, meeting them after this to see a couple of Broadway shows. And oh. you know what? For some reason on my um, calendar on my iPhone, it was popping up. Oh, it's time to check in. Oh, the Broadway. Oh, the flat. So I was kind of like, mur, mur. Yeah. That, However, that. What I am doing this week is really working with my team to take a look at uh, how can we better serve our clients right now who are in desperate need of help. Mm. And that's what we're doing all week. And I'm building a puzzle, which is behind me. So okay. <laughs> excellent. A little distraction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Steve, what would you normally be doing this week? And, and what do you find yourself doing that you didn't expect? Uh, usually I'd be doing a combination of counseling and speaking. Uh, the speaking gigs have kind of, you know, been pushed to the fall for obvious reasons. Uh, but typically my, my counseling would be, you know, 90% in person, 10% teletherapy. Hmm. And then the coronavirus happened in, in, in the words of Forrest Gump, you know, and just like that, I became a teletherapist. Like <laughs> it just, it just happened. And now it's a hundred percent teletherapy, which, um, has its pros and cons, you know, I don't have to feel like I have to get like too dressed up for it, but, um, I do kind of miss the in-person interaction that you just can't translate through video. Um, but otherwise, you know, can't complain. Yeah. I think that, that your stories are very similar to what a lot of folks are dealing with. I think at this time, uh, I was actually supposed to be prepping, uh, delivering a program for one of our clients on uh, feedback skills for leaders and overcoming defensiveness and performance management. Uh, and I was we're going to be prepping to, to keynote a large ophthalmology conference. Uh, mm -hmm. But instead, what I'm doing that I didn't expect is running a third grade, first grade, and preschool classroom out of our house right yeah. now, yeah. which presents its own unique challenges. So, um, yeah. all right, let me give everyone who is listening a, a quick uh, two minute overview of the content that we have for you today and, and what the plan is. Um, everything that we have planned for you today is based on what you told us you are struggling with. You may recall upon registration, we asked, what's your biggest struggle as a leader, as a parent, as a partner? And are there any questions you wanna ask during this broadcast? And so we had uh, over 300 comments to sort through. So what we did is we ended up putting those into buckets uh, and they actually fit quite nicely into three buckets. I'm gonna show those to you now, maybe. Here we go. The first bucket we called anxiety and emotions. Uh, and these are the different kinds of things that, that fell into that bucket. People are challenging with finance, or people are, are experiencing challenges related to financial stress and job worries, feelings of fear and uncertainty and negativity, um, struggling with how to stay positive and help the folks around them stay positive, uh, balancing and juggling multiple roles at the same time or being the person who has to do it all. Uh, some folks are struggling with feelings of isolation, cabin fever, and boredom. Uh, some folks talked about the struggle with information overload. How do I stay plugged into what's going on but not have it be overwhelming and, uh, and, and create additional anxiety? Um, also, exhaustion, facing danger and threats and risk of disease and, and all those things, especially for those folks who work on the front lines right now. Uh, and for some folks, it's managing my time, managing my patience and all the emotions that come with that. So bucket number one was anxiety emotions and emotions. And um, our resident uh, counselor in chief, Steve, is going to take the lead on this with us here in just a minute. Uh, segment number two of the broadcast today is going to be on leadership and teams. Uh, we had a lot of comments related to being more effective in the current circumstances. And specifically, I'm struggling with guilt and worry about laying people off or about some of our sites having to close. Uh, I'm struggling with issues around staffing and volume and handling what's to come. Um, how do I keep my staff calm? How do I overcome their fears? How do I keep them from spreading negativity or panic or rumors? Um, a lot of questions came around, how do I keep my teams engaged and focused and productive uh, in the midst of this crisis? Uh, we had a number of folks who talked about information changing so quickly and how do I communicate that effectively and uh, while not doing information overload. 
And we had some folks who talked about remote work challenges of, of feeling disconnected from their teams and uh, how do I check in and what's too much versus not enough. Uh, and there were a few comments about folks who struggled with uh, their bosses and their partners uh, acting as if everything they asked for was urgent, drop everything right now and handle my problem, or having to deal with 24-7 calls and texts from uh, their bosses, from furloughed staff, etc. So that's segment number two today. We're going to, Renee and I are going to spend a little bit of time talking about this. Uh, and then last but not least, our third bucket was parenting and family. And so a number of folks reported struggles with being productive at work while managing kids and, and being stuck at home. Um, how do I keep my family informed or calm and, and manage all of their emotions in our home? Um, how, do I, uh, how do I schedule and plan activities uh, to keep my kids or the, or the people around us uh, from being bored and, and being isolated? Uh, also folks looking for advice around routines and structure. Um, we had a number of folks who described caregiver challenges. They uh, are caring for elderly parents and kids at the same time in different locations, uh, or maybe you have a, an immunocompromised uh, family member and you're really worried about what, what the impact is gonna be for them and, and keeping them safe. Uh, so a lot of comments about that. Uh, and a couple of comments of folks saying, listen, I love my family, but I have grown quite tired of them. Uh, and could really uh, find, would appreciate a, a way to find some space and some time off from each other. Uh, so those are our three buckets for today. Um, I want to dive right in here with anxiety and emotions uh, and turn us over to Steve. Now, Steve, we have a lot of things on that list. Uh, as do. you think about all of the struggles that people have, uh, where do you want to start today in terms of helping people be mentally fit right now? So we have to start with an acknowledgement. When, when this first kind of came out, some of my tips and advice and initial thinking was, well, let's embrace this as a staycation. Let's play guitar. Let's read a book. Let's do these kind of fun leisure activities or things that we don't usually have time to do, the things to work on our business rather than in it. The challenge with that is that there's this bandwidth sucking stress thinking that's going on for all of us that is very real. It's this sense of hypervigilance that we have when we're in fight or flight mode. And we are constantly fighting an invisible enemy, every one of us, that we're not used to fighting. We're not used to washing our hands as often as we are, uh, wearing a mask out in public perhaps, you know, all of these things that we are trying to orient our brains to that are taking a lot of our mental space. And so with that, I have to first recognize that, that we're all going through this hypervigilance and we all perhaps ought to be a bit easier on ourselves to recognize that this stress thinking is totally normal. And if we're, you know, seeing someone else read a book or play guitar or go for a run, you know, uh, whatever that may be, to not judge yourself for feeling the way we're feeling or thinking the way we're thinking. There's no right or wrong to this and everybody is worrying, everybody is concerned. Uh, the, the silver lining is we're all in it together. Mm -hmm. Literally everyone is going through this. So for today, I have just a couple tips. I wasn't able to touch all of it. I wish I could. I wish I could talk about, you know, four buckets of organizing your time and strategies to fill up white space. But I kind of went through that list and I picked, you know, what are the two major points I want people to take from this? And those two major points are this. Two major thought traps, right? One is the thinking of my anxiety. When I'm working as a therapist, I see a lot of people who say, my depression, my anxiety, right? They possess it as a part of their identity. And this is really scary for mental health standpoint because we have a cold, we don't become our cold. We notice it, we experience it, we feel it, but we don't identify with it, we don't become it. The same thing I can, can be true of our emotions, right? I can feel stressed, I can feel anxious, I can feel worried, I can feel concerned, but if I feel all of those things and I resist them, the script becomes something like this. I feel concerned, I feel worried. Why am I feeling worried? I hate feeling worried. I worry that other people might think that I feel worried and I'm supposed to be a leader. Uh, I shouldn't be feeling worried, I shouldn't feel this way. Why am I feeling this way? I hate feeling this way. And what you resist persists. And then worse, it becomes your I am statement. So it's I'm feeling anxious, therefore I am anxious, I am overwhelmed, my anxiety is overwhelming me. And that the whole script of that self-talk is self-fulfilling 
and just very negative all over in that it's toxic and it, it kind of manifests and projects itself. So my first tip to, for today is to take the thinking of my anxiety or my depression or whatever emotion you're experiencing and to remove my and instead have a script like this. I'm feeling a bit stressed and that's okay. These are challenging times. I, I, you know, I'm praying for the health of my family and loved ones. Um, you know, that uh, it's, it's a time of hypervigilance and, and a, a world is in crisis. It's okay. It makes sense that I feel this way. I can allow it, not resist it. And then to follow that up with that statement of allowance, and that's okay, but I am. There's a blank here because that blank is largely up to you. That blank is only defined by you. The short and skinny of it is that your emotions don't define you, only you define you, right? So it's, I'm feeling a bit stressed, I'm feeling a bit frustrated, I'm feeling a bit scared, but I am resilient. I am flexible, I am strong, I am courageous, right? We don't want the emotions to define us, only you define you. And recognizing that thought trap of resisting the emotion or having the emotion become your I am statement or possessing the emotion with a, a my type of language is tip number one. Uh, Joe, oh, Renee, any thoughts there? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, so much of what you're saying, I think, is about helping people not get mired in for a long period of time those feelings which can very easily take over during this this difficult time and, and there's a difference between saying i am scared versus i feel scared uh, because feelings exist in moments and those moments will pass and i love yes. that second statement that you point people toward to say uh but i am this because in a way it almost accelerates our movement through those difficult feelings but and also it sets us up not to invalidate those feelings right like you did that that little kind of self the narration in your head where it's like, I hate feeling scared and I don't like this. And we get caught up in that and we almost uh, get down on ourselves for feeling that way. Like right. I shouldn't feel that way. And what I hear you saying is it not only is it totally normal to feel that way, but let's say it out loud. Let's take some energy away from it and then let's let it run its course. Yep. Yeah, and that's, well said. that's what I got from that, Steve. Mm -hmm. I think especially because I know we have a lot of leaders on this webinar who yes. may you know, feel that they should not be scared and worried and anxious and stressed. And I think it's giving us all permission to have those feelings, but then it's what you do about them. And, and I really like that sort of spin because I was thinking of my own anxieties, fears, and concerns and how they show up sometimes, you know, uh, randomly throughout the day, but just to pause and say, wait a minute, it's okay that I feel this way. Now what, I need, what do I need to do about it? How do I shift my mindset? So I think that's really important for everybody on the call today. Nice, yeah, it's, it's important to notice these feelings but not get swept up in the storm as much as possible. And the second thing I wanna, I wanna mention is that in addition to us all having a sense of hypervigilance, we are all going through a low level grief and loss right now, mm -hmm. everybody in the world. Um, because we all had expectations of something this spring that we thought we were going to be doing that we are not now doing, whether it's speaking or a home improvement or a graduation or a wedding or um, being able to attend a funeral. These are things that we did not expect and life threw us all a gigantic curveball. And it's okay that we are all going through kind of a, a, an adjustment phase and feeling these feelings of grief and loss, whether they're shock, sadness, uh, bargaining, acceptance and kind of experiencing them all moment to moment yeah. uh, and kind of all at once and kind of in waves. And so that's, that's okay too. We're, we're all there right now. We're all allowed to experience that. Mm -hmm. My second point is this. I saw a lot of questions, sorry, I'm moving off camera there. I saw a lot of questions uh, regarding, you know, how can I be strong for my team? Uh, my team is, you know, how can I help them through this? And one of, the, one of the things that I do as a therapist is I don't try to fix people. I, I often try not to give advice. I don't tell them what to do. I don't assume what's best for them. I don't have all the answers and I can't make the hard stuff go away. I think leaders have very much the same functioning and role. That it is not our job to correct the situation. Uh, and sometimes it is rather just to share in the emotion with that person to hold space for them and listen to what they're going through and to connect with them, even if it's virtually, to check in, 
to share in that emotion, but not, not try to minimize it, not try to correct it, not anything that invalidates it, but just say, I, I hear you, I feel you, I'm here with you too. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that might take some of the burden off of you know, leaders in this field to think that it's not your job to correct it. It's not always your job to fix it. Yes, you want to be a strong role model. And yes, your I am statements and your courage will get mirrored throughout your organization. But we're all in this together. And sometimes just the simple answer is to hold space and share in that emotion with the person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and Steve, so many of the comments that were in our initial registration were around how do I I stay positive and help the other people around me stay positive. And, you know, I want to give everyone listening permission not to take that on. Just like you said, it, yeah. it's not your job to, to lift all the folks around you. You don't have the capacity for that. And it's not fair to, to take that burden on. Um, right. But it, what I would encourage you to do is just, as you described, Steve, is just validate where they're at, right? When we try to cheer people yeah. up, in a way, it's almost signaling to them that their emotions are invalid in the moment, Correct. right? Yes. We respond to people feeling down or upset, and we try to cheer them up sometimes because their discomfort is making us uncomfortable. Uh, and in a way, when we show up for that person in that way and we just try to cheer them up, we're not doing them any favors. It's, right. it's far more effective to do what you describe, which is to say, yeah, you're right. I, I bet that's really hard. Um, I, I completely understand where you're coming from and it's okay that yeah. you feel that way. Yeah, you're right to feel that way and to share in the motion with that person, not to try to kind of overly relate to it in an upstaging way, not to try to correct it, not to ignore mm-hmm. it but just simply to share. And it's an emotionally intelligent response that leaders can do that increases a sense of connection, which is what we're all seeking and we all need right now. Right, right. I want to encourage you, if you're listening to the webcast, um, we do have a Q&A feature on here. So if you'd like to ask questions along the way, I will periodically try to monitor those through our discussion. Um, as I said, we got almost 300 questions and comments at registration. Uh, and so we're going to try to hit as many of those as we can with the content we've prepared. Uh, but I will certainly uh, keep an eye on these questions as well and try to work them in uh, where we can. Um, Steve, when you think about the folks who are listening to this and um, those moments of kind of rising tension and panic that people yeah. have, um, you know, I, I tend to be a, a, a pretty logic-based person. Um, and so my, my mindset and self-talk is always kind of moving through, okay, this is what might be, this is the scary thing, but what's yeah. more likely or what is, right? And that might be versus is helps me a lot in my self-talk, but I know not everybody is as logical. Some people are, are more uh, tied to emotion and reaction and response. What advice do you have for folks when they feel that rising tension or those flashes of panic to help them in that moment uh, survive those kinds of, of uh, reactions? Whew, that's a, that a good question. Um, so I think what you're describing is kind of getting lost in a series of hypotheticals that are usually, if I were to give worry its simplest definition, it's a headspace that is a future negative headspace. Mm. And we can get lost in hypotheticals for days. And that's hard when that cycle stops for some people or when that cycle starts, excuse me, to stop it. And one of the things to do to stop it is kind of to do kind of what you do, Joe, and, and, and it is to run it through a very simple filter. And that is to observe the thought, recognize it as separate from yourself, but observe it. And then to ask yourself, you know, is this a hypothetical? In which case I have to kind of let go and let the world unfold as it should. Is this something I have control of? In which case you can take action in the moment. So a simple illustration of that, but kind of an unrelated example, say I'm driving home today, there's a chance I could hit a deer on the way home. Right? That doesn't happen, mm-hmm. um, but that is completely out of my control. I cannot control whether the deer chooses that moment to cross the road, so probably not me worth worrying about it. Mm-hmm. What I can't control is making sure that you know I'm not texting and driving and I'm doing the speed limit and things like that. Yeah. And I think running your worries through that initial filter, is this a hypothetical? Um, can I let go and let the world unfold as I should? Is this something I have immediate control of and what can I take action today to do? is a great filter to kind of um, to process those thoughts through to make them, you know, kind of more useful and help you stay grounded and present in the moment. Yeah. Wonderful. Steve, thank you so much. I, I have actually got a lot out of that. So thank Me you. Too. Very much. Like, that cool. was wonderful. All right.
Um, <laughs> in the interest of time, we're going to jump right into segment two here, um, which is about leadership and, and teams. And just to give everybody a, a snapshot of this one more time, um, these were the challenges that folks were describing um, when they asked about leadership and teams. Um, a lot here, Renee, a lot going on for folks. Um, you and I both have worked in healthcare for a long time. I know a lot of the folks on the broadcast today do work in healthcare. And one of the reasons that I wanted you to be a part of our webcast today, Renee, is because I know that you've been having conversations almost every day for the last couple of weeks with, with leaders and organizations who are working on the front lines in healthcare, who are struggling with all of the things on this list. Yep. Tell me about the conversations that you're having and, the, and the, the advice that you're giving folks that is resonating the most with them. Sure, sure. Um, can you show slide two, Joe? Oh, sure. Yeah, you had the anxiety one. Oh, um, sorry. You're right. You know, in times of crisis, we see the best in people and the worst in people. And even in healthcare, where we're being identified right now as the heroes, healthcare, we are saving the world. Scientists, nurses, physicians, support staff, respiratory. Um, we're still seeing really bad behavior show up. And I've been talking with a lot of leaders who are telling me, I'm the one that has to show up every day, even though I have my own anxieties and fears and concerns. But as soon as I cross that threshold of my workspace, I have to put my game face on and deal with this. And you know, that, that's a heavy burden to carry as a leader, knowing that everybody's watching you. You know this, just like a parent, your kids are looking at you and your reaction to know the state of, you know, the crisis. So based on what they were sharing with me, I just want to share three tips with the audience that I think will help. Mm. First of all, and this is, like I said, based on what people have been sharing with me, First of all, please don't make promises you can't keep. I've had so many leaders tell me, like I told them at the beginning of this crisis, don't worry. Nobody's gonna be asked to change their shift or take PTO time. We're gonna remain open, it'll be fine. And then a week later, they shut down half of their clinic or an entire surgical center. Or they're asking people to take PTO time now. And then you lose credibility as a leader. So do not make promises that you can't keep. And I was really, um, uh, I was not surprised to see how do you deal with this communication overload. This is something that leaders keep telling me. I meet with my team and we have a huddle and I say, here's what we're going to do. And then an hour later, I come back and say, scratch that. We're doing this instead. And that's happening over and over and over again. And what I shared with the leaders was this. When you meet with your team, it's saying to them, this is the information that I have right now. And you need to know that this might change an hour from now, uh, uh, two hours from now. And here's the, the kind of script that I want you to use. Say to your staff, I need you to trust that the administrators here in this organization are making the very best decisions based on the information that we have now. And just know that that will change as we get additional information, but you need to trust us that we're making decisions based on what's best for the patients who we're serving and based on what's best for you as employees. And then the last thing that they were sharing with me, again, and this is, we're, we're seeing a lot of pettiness, nitpicking. Why did, you know, how come he didn't have to change his schedule and I had to change mine? And we're seeing this show up a lot. Um, and what I've been advising leaders to do is basically say, look, here's the deal. I need every single one of us to show up as the very best versions of ourselves today today and especially this really relates to what we were talking earlier anxieties and fears and forecasting and what might happen we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow the next day but today we're okay and we're going to do the very best that we can today and because you only really have control over today and then i said this so you can use this if you want especially with the nitpicking and the pettiness say to that person Neither you nor I have any extra energy 
to spend on nitpicking, pettiness, gossip, okay, whatever the behaviors are. We don't have time for this today because the energy that we have needs to go to serving our patients and each other. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a shame that we're dealing with the very worst in human beings. But again, it comes from a place of I'm scared, I'm reacting. But as, as leaders, I think it's important that you show up every day with your game face on and to be the very best version of yourself as a leader. Yeah. And it ties so well back to what Steve said too, yeah. which is that, yes, we have to go in and do this, but let's not forget to mention that if, if you have to go in and put your game face on and, you know, so many, so many folks responded to our questions by describing the need to essentially flip a switch. I'm scared. I don't have the answers. I don't know. Things are changing minute to minute. I've got to show up and be a, a, um, a leader, be someone who has confidence, be someone who seems to have the answers, even when I don't. And, and they're really struggling with that. And so if you are going to work and you're doing the things that Renee describes, let's make sure that you are building in some time at the end of those days to not be that to turn that switch off, yeah. to, to decompress in some way. If you need to fall apart for an hour in the bathroom, then fall apart for an hour in the bathroom. You've got to let that out, right? Uh, in order to be able to go back in the next day and flip that switch. Uh, and so I, I, I so appreciate what you said there at the end, Renee, especially about how if we encounter bad behavior, that it's rooted in fear and it's, it's rooted in discomfort. Um, I, I got a question uh, a couple of days ago from one of our clients about um, how do I stop that one person on my team from awfulizing? You know, yeah. that, that person that goes around and just is constantly giving voice to negativity, um, and which for the record, I love the word awfulizing. Um, let's write that down, let's use it, let's make t-shirts. But when we think about that person who is awfulizing, the first thing to recognize is that that behavior is rooted in fear. And so as a leader, we need to check in with that person uh, and do it at a human level. It's not about the work. It's about, are you okay? What's happening with you? I care about you. How can I help you? How can I support you? And once you do that, once you have those conversations, uh, if we have folks who are awfulizing, I think we as leaders need to gently but directly name that behavior and talk about the impact that it's having. Uh, mm -hmm. I was uh, coaching this person to, to you, you know, you and I both love scripts, Renee, and, and one of the scripts oh, that yeah. I gave her is that um, we can sit across from that person and we can ask them this question. Do you realize how much influence you have around here? And you just let that sit for a minute because that person's going to lean forward in their chair and they might say, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. And then you can describe the ways in which their voice carries weight. And what I encourage this person to say is, whether you realize it or not, every day what comes out of your mouth either nudges people towards hope or fear. Yeah. And what I've noticed is that when you're having a rough time and you give voice to it, it nudges everybody toward fear. And it's doing harm on our team. How do we fix that? And you hopefully try to spark a conversation where they become more aware of what they're giving voice to, or, or at least you create some kind of agreement where if they need to express those thoughts and feelings, they come into your office and they close the door and they do that for a minute or two just to get it out, right? Uh, so that they can use their powers of influence for good. Yeah, exactly. and it's, it's tough right now, Joe, because the whole, the whole world's in a fear-based state. And we are not thinking, you know, with a mindset of abundance, we're thinking of mindsets of scarcity, we're worried about making ends meet, we're worried about retaining employees, mm -hmm. we have constant bandwidth sucking stress thinking going on. Yeah. Uh, as a leader, however, it's important to recognize that and to any way in which we can offer a love based response to not amplify that fear, to cast out that fear, to, you know, to offer a sense of, you know, I'm here to listen and to offer grace to that person who mm -hmm. is struggling and who is, you know, kind of sucked into a fear-based emotional state. Um, but to recognize that that's, that's, that's going to happen in these times right now and to be the best leader you can to not get sucked into that, but to offer love and grace and kindness. Mm -hmm. I think that then often gets mirrored and is contagious throughout, you know, an organization. Um, and just, I just want to address one of the, a question came up through, um, the, the chat and I wasn't sure if everybody saw it or not, but somebody asked me to repeat the script 
because I absolutely agree with um, both you, Joe, and Steve, and having these conversations with them. Um, sometimes, though, uh, you need to be quick, and you need to be very pointed, and it's saying to that person, so I'm just going to repeat the script. Like, today, I need you to show up. So, like, today. Okay? Like, I'm not worried about tomorrow. Today, I need you to show up as the very best version of yourself. Neither you nor I have any extra energy to give to pettiness, nitpicking, Okay. So this is what I need to see from you today, because I think it does help remind people that we truly only have control over how we each respond in the moment, in the day. And that's you too, as a leader. I want you to think about that as um, you show up every day. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure I repeated that um, script just in case um, I typed it in and I didn't know if everybody got it. Got it. it. Yeah. It's good. I, you know, yeah. So many of the questions that came in too, for me, I think it's really important that when a leader leaves their house or doesn't, right, logs into something virtually, um, to engage with their team or mm -hmm. to engage with the people around them, that they're doing so with the, my, the right mindset. A lot of our questions were about engagement, productivity, motivation. Um, you know, this is a generational event. Our kids' kids are going to be asking about what this was like. This is a, 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 a mile marker on the journey of humankind that we will point back to. Uh, you know, it's 9-11. It's, it's the JFK assassination. It's, it's I remember where I was when. Mm -hmm. And because of that, there is absolutely no way you can expect optimal performance. There is no way you can expect right. productivity as is normally expected. And it's because you know, that list that we just showed at the beginning of this webcast, all of that stuff is burning intensely inside every single person on your team. So there is a necessary moving of the goalposts that needs to happen with regard to our expectations. Um, we need to reduce our expectations about what people can can produce or or put out or perform while dramatically increasing the, the expressions of concern and caring that we give to those folks, the number of check-ins that we do with those folks. For the folks on the webcast who have read my books or followed me for any amount of time, you know I like to say that, that leadership is creating the conditions for people to thrive. And that's true most of the time. I would say the exception is that in times of crisis, our job as leaders is to create the conditions that allow people to survive. Right. If our job as leaders is to help people be at their best every single day, their best changes depending on their circumstances. And so when we go in and connect with people at a relationship level and we care about the person inside the employee, we can better ascertain what that person's best is for that day, what they are capable of for that day. Uh, and know that if people aren't able to show up at 110 percent, that is not a character flaw. That is not a defect. That is reality for everyone right now. So if you're sitting there going, how do I get more out of my team? How do I get them to show up as I normally expect them to do? How do I get engagement to continue at the highest level possible? You don't, and we have to accept that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point, Joe. It's, um, again, taking a look at shifting priorities and what are the best decisions that we can make as a team mm -hmm. today? Yeah, yep. one day at a time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I can't believe it, but we only have five minutes left, which tells me we should have made this much longer. Uh, maybe we'll do another one down the line. Maybe we'll launch a series called Two Beards and a Nurse. And we will, <laughs> but, but Steve's beard game is much stronger than mine. At this yeah, point. I have no facial That's, hair. So. Yeah. All right. um, but with our, our last five minutes, I want to make sure that we spend a little bit of time in, in the parenting and family side. So let me put this list back up again uh, so that we can quickly reconnect with it. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that none of us on the call today are parenting experts. Right, um, and so I, I'm taking off my subject matter expert hat as it relates to employee engagement and leadership. Uh, and I want to acknowledge that the conversation we're about to have related to parenting and family is just from perspective and experience. Uh, again, we don't claim to have all of the answers, um, but when it comes to the things that people are struggling with at home right now, um, Renee, I want to start with you because a question came in that kind of fits into this category uh, that I think is really important to, to talk about. It's from Ella and she says, can I have some strategies to stay connected to my non-healthcare spouse 
when I'm experiencing quite an interesting time on the healthcare front line. Yeah. So I'm assuming they're they're in the same home, though, right? I, I think that's what she's asking. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I'm with my spouse all day long, and although he works in the business with me, it's really taking a look at having some time every day where you do sort of a debrief. So especially, um, it, it, am I correct in saying it's her spouse who's working in healthcare and she's not? Or no, she is. She is. She has the non-healthcare spouse. Set it up ahead of time if this is important to you. Because for some people, they don't need this. But if you do, establish that with your spouse to say, each day when I come home or at a certain day of the week or whatever that means for you, can we just sit down for 15 minutes so that I can share with you some of what I'm going through? Um, I actually did this last week. I was having a day where as a business owner and okay, I was having, I was thinking, oh my gosh, what if, what if, what if, and I was really struggling with my own emotions. And I sat down with my husband and I said, this is what I'm feeling right now. This is what I'm going through. And we had this amazing conversation and it was so cathartic. It was so helpful. So what I would suggest is to find deliberate time, be very intentional about it so that you can share some of the stuff that's in your head. Cause once you share it, it kind of gets out of your head at least a little bit. Yeah. So that would be my advice. Yeah. Great. Very therapeutic advice. No doubt. I like it. Yeah. And I'm yeah, not a second career as a counselor, Renee. I know. <laughs> um, before I jump into the parenting thing, there's one other question that just came in. I want to speak to it super fast. Uh, Deb asked, although I have a great team working remotely, I'm struggling with are they really working during their full eight hours th uh, that they are reporting any ideas? I'm going to give you a piece of advice that I'm not sure you're going to like, Deb. Um, but in terms of where we're at right now, um, my advice simply is less proof, more trust. Um, everybody's, I think most of the time, assume that the people around you are doing the very best that they can given the circumstances. And if you interact with them and you say, um, how much are you doing? How are you proving it to me? Are you filling out these reports? They're going to feel like your priorities are out of whack. But if you go back to them and you say, listen, I know these are unique circumstances. I know there's a lot going on with you at home and with family. I trust that you are doing the very best you can right now, given the circumstances, how can I support you? And when you ratchet up the trust and you ratchet up the, the caring, you actually will get more productivity out yeah, of that. You person. give them that good reputation to live up to and they'll want to not let you down. Uh, that's very well said, Joe. And I think, I think it's tough for a lot of people right now because if you're a parent working from home, you're not working in an environment that is controlled. Uh, you're working with kids and then you have pressure to teach your kids who may not be perfectly self-directed. So you're wearing not only the hat of remote working, which everybody's adjusting to, plus being a teacher for your kids, which nobody's used to, and then also having the bandwidth sucking worry of the kind of existential worry that we're all going through right now. Right. That's a lot of hats and a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of stuff going on. So I yeah. think that, that, that play of, I assume, you know, good intentions. I know you're doing the best you can. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate everything that you're doing working remotely and, and going through this adjustment period and making the best of it. I think that appreciation and understanding of good intentions and a good reputation to live up to is absolutely the right play. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to have a stick around just for an extra couple of minutes here because I, I have a couple of things that I want to make sure that we share for the parents who are on the, the uh, I almost called it a call. No, we don't do that anymore. This is a yeah. webcast. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to speak to a couple of things that we tried and failed. Um, so I, I work full time in my business. Uh, my wife works. We have three kids under the age of 10. Um, so it's been a real juggling act for us to figure out uh, in the last three weeks uh, how to navigate this. I live in Western Pennsylvania, just outside of Pittsburgh. Uh, our schools have been closed. Uh, I think, is this the third week? I think that we're into. Yeah, third week that our schools have been closed. Um, we started out with a schedule. So we actually figured out a schedule for the day. We put it up on a whiteboard from this time to this time, we're going to do this. And from this time to this time, we're going to do that. And we mixed the required schoolwork in with the meals and then some fun stuff. Uh, I, I posted a couple of pictures of those schedules in mm -hmm. Facebook. Uh, and I will tell you that they never went to plan. It never went that way that you think it's going to go. Uh, we were getting stressed out that like, oh, we're not sticking to the schedule. And so we finally took a breath and we said, is there a better way to do this? And so we have actually shifted from a schedule to a very small checklist. And what we do is we sit down at dinner with the kids and we say, what is important 
to you for us to include in tomorrow's checklist. Now they're always gonna ask for iPad time and they're always gonna ask for candy. <laughs> and so we say, it can't involve a screen or candy. But we'll build those in, trust us, you'll get your regulated iPad time. Funny. But what else? You know, and my son said, can we play Clue? You know, my daughter said, can I ride my bike in the driveway? And so we put those things on the checklist. And yes, you got to take baths and you got to put your laundry away. You got to finish your schoolwork, but we're going to play Clue and we're going to play in the driveway. And we just said, this, these are the things that are going to happen today. And we didn't say when they were going to happen or in what order, um, but we use that kind of as a compass and it has really helped. It's really made a huge difference for us. Mm -hmm. Steve, Renee, anything to add to that? You know, I think, I think making it simple and streamlined is the way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, anything too complicated right now uh, is just going to be too much for people's minds to try to take on. So if we can keep it simple and streamlined, I think that's the better approach. Okay. Yeah, and I don't have any little kids at home, um, but my daughter does. She's working from home and she has a 20-month-old. And so her and I have talked about how does she manage her daughter and work at the same time. And it's very similar to what you said, Joe. It's what are the most important things that I, we need to do today, we need to get done. How do I take care of my daughter while I'm you know, um, trying to work? And it's, it's having a soft plan each day that's decided the night before. And there are some good days and some days that it doesn't work so well, but that's okay. Yeah, uh, and I just in, 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 in the interest of being helpful and transparent, Here's the list of ideas that we've been working off of to keep our young kids occupied and engaged and keep the cabin fever down to a minimum. We have been playing a lot of board games. Uh, we've been coloring. Uh, we're trying to do some cooking together. So we're gonna you know, make some meals, but also let's, let's make cupcakes or you know, let's, we made Rice Krispies treats the other day and then my son burned his hand. Uh, you know. uh, we are doing puzzles. Um, we colored pictures and wrote letters to all the grandparents and then we disinfected them and sent them in the mail. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to take walks around the house uh, and outside in the neighborhood, social distancing, of course. Um, we've done some video calls with friends and family, things like that. Um, I just had the brainstorm this morning that, you know what, you could play charades with a big group of people <laughs> totally. over Zoom. And so I may, I may try to set that up for some family and as a way to just have some fun and connect. Um, you know, keep a little notepad nearby and every time you, you kind of get an idea for something that you could do, just jot it down and create a little menu of options that you can kind of go back to over and over again, wherever possible. Uh, and then also build in, do whatever you want time, you know, where you, where you tell the people around you, this is time where everybody gets to do whatever they want. And you figure out how to fit that in uh, as well. On top of that, though, is, is I think it's important to have, continue to have the conversations with your kids about what's happening right now, what it means, um, and what you're struggling with, even as a parent. You know, many kids are old enough to at least understand that at some fundamental level um, and try to give them some control. You know, I always try to ask my kids, uh, how do you feel? Why do you think you feel that way? What do you think you can do about it? Uh, what's important to you? Uh, and so those have led to some really great conversations with my kids along the way. Other thoughts, ideas, suggestions, folks? Uh, Joe, I just got to say in the parenting realm, you know, blessed are the flexible for they're never bent out of shape. And I think a mental mantra uh, that I stole from Michael McGriff there, blessed okay. are the flexible for you're never bent out of shape, goes a long way in kind of rolling with all of this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and, and I think we need to give ourselves grace, right? The, the truth is that having to be on kid duty 24 seven right now is probably, I think the hardest part of a lot of this for many of us. Um, so don't sweat the small stuff. Right now, we're not being as restrictive around things like screen time and snacking. I mean, of course we still have our limits, uh, but it's liberating to say yes a little bit more than normal because these are abnormal times. I'm just um, typing an answer for somebody. It's like, how does somebody deal with a 20 month old when they've got to, to work? It, it's a struggle. It's like the, the meetings that she can try to schedule you know, she can schedule, she tries to schedule them around when Olivia will be napping. Uh, truth be told, she's letting her watch videos that she might not normally let her watch. And then if she has a mandatory meeting, then she'll save Olivia's favorite toy for her to play with during that meeting. But it's not easy. 
And the people around us get it. You know, I've seen a lot of things online about how if you have a crazy 20 month year old who's screaming her head off and you need to hold her in your lap during your conference call, <laughs> then do it. You mute the call and you sit there and you get yeah. you hit in the face a couple of times with your kid and everybody gets it. I think most yeah. people are forgiving. Yeah. Um, Amy says, um, put your kid in the toddler backpack and let them write in your hair with a highlighter. I love it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. So, um, you know, we, we've talked a lot today about giving grace. And I think we've talked a lot about giving grace to yourselves. Uh, but I also think it's a reminder to give grace to each other. Uh, Renee's wearing her be kind pin. It couldn't be more appropriate right now. Um, and so with that, uh, I want to ask each of our panelists to share a final thought as we wrap up today. Uh, Steve, final thoughts. Oh man. Uh, somebody said crisis reveals character. Uh, and, and I, I like that quote. Um, and I also like the one from Mr. Rogers, you know, in a time of crisis, look to the helpers. Mm -hmm. Um, the challenge with that is that we are all called in the healthcare profession to be the helpers that the world is looking to as heroes right now. And that is not easy, but I think the same advice that Mr. Rogers gives to, to give to children in a time of crisis also applies to us as adults. If we need a synergistic effect, if we need a pick me up, Let's look to each other. Let's connect. Let's be there for one another because uh, we are all kind of in this together. And I think if we can do that and keep up morale in that regard, that gives us our best shot at, at getting through this in, in the most mentally fit way possible. Yeah. Fantastic. Love it. Renee. So I've been talking with a lot of leaders, but I've also been talking with frontline. And if you're on this call and you're a leader, here's what your frontline want from you. They want to just know that you care about them. You're behind the scenes doing all these things, but to connect with your team every day and say, I'm here, I care about you, are you okay today? Is your family okay? Please don't forget those relationships that you have with their, your team. They just wanna know that you care. Mm, Definitely. I love it. Yeah. I was thinking about my final thought for today, and I kept coming back to uh, the serenity prayer, which most people are familiar with. If you're in recovery, you're definitely familiar with it. Uh, it's this idea of um, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And I think if you start, try to start with the wisdom and evaluate, is this something that I need to accept that I cannot change? Or is this something that I need to have the courage to try and change? Do that for yourself. And if you're leading, try to do that that for others without putting the pressure on yourself to have all of the answers. It's okay to say, I don't have the answer to that question right now, but here's my best guess. And to give yourself uh, the space to do that as well. Um, I am super grateful to all of you for joining us. We had 117 people live at the start. Wow. 107 of them are still here. And that's all amazing. right. <laughs> um, and to answer a question asked earlier, yes, this has been recorded. Uh, we are going to push this out over email to everybody who registered. You are welcome to share this. You use it as a tool. Um, we are all just trying to hold hands together and get through this. Maybe not hold hands, um, but just try to, to, to use this Our as a tool. Hands. Yes, virtually hold hands uh, to, to get through this. So I, I know I speak for Steve and Renee when I say share this far and wide, use it however it yes. can be useful uh, for you, your families and the, the teams around you. Uh, and I know I speak for these two as well when I say, uh, especially if you're working on the front lines in healthcare, thank you for all that you do to take care of so many. You are heroes and we see your capes. Thanks everyone for being here today and good luck out there.